Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Peter Lawford in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents part one of the first detective novel ever written, a tale considered by many to be the greatest ever written. Wilkie Collins, The Moonstone, our star, Mr. Peter Lawford. Last call, last call. Last call for what, Harlow? Why, last call for that winter car check, Hap. Not much more time to get the oil and grease changed, put in antifreeze. And check those important spark plugs, too. You said it, Johnny Plug Check. The spark plugs are the very heart of a car's ignition system. They've got to be right for quick, cold weather starts. So have them checked by your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. He's an expert on cleaning and adjustment. But suppose those spark plugs are worn out, Harlow. Why then, Hap, your Autolite spark plug dealer will heartily and happily suggest a set of world-famous Autolite spark plugs like the amazing Double Life Resistor Spark Plug. So get those spark plugs checked tomorrow, and you'll avoid cold weather sorrow. And do it at your Autolite Spark Plug dealers. To quickly locate him, phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents part one of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, starring Mr. Peter Lawford, hoping once again to keep you in... Suspense. Look, my lord. There's the house. Silence, boy. My eyes behold. Have you chosen a place, my brother? Beneath these trees, my brother. Are we observed? No. Begin it. Boy, look to my eyes. Please, not again. Please don't miss me. Look to my eyes. Yes, my lord. In the name of the regent of the night, lord of the world, whose arms embrace the four corners of earth, your servants, O lord, dedicated to end the vile sacrilege of unbelievers, dedicated to restore what is rightfully yours. Use this body we offer you. Give us the power of your sight. He is ready, my brother. See the Englishman who has returned from foreign parts. I see him. Is it to this house and no other he will travel today? To this house. And no other. And he brings it with him? Yes. He brings it. And as the sun sets, he will enter the house? I, I can't see. See? Tell us. I can't. The yellowness rises in my head. I can't see. It is enough, my brother. He will come. And he will bring the moonstone. It was in May of 1848 that I received news of the death of my uncle, Colonel John Herncastle. The letter caught up to me in Italy with instructions that I return to England and perform my duties as executor of my uncle's will. Not having seen my uncle since childhood, I felt neither one way or the other about his death. But I remembered the story. A black sheep with a strong dash of savage. He had fought in India and come home with a vile reputation which had closed the doors of all his relations against him. His sister, Lady Julia Verinda, had taken the lead in this respect. Colonel John never set foot in her great Yorkshire house. Naturally, this all went through my mind as I entered the office of our family lawyer, Mr. Matthew Brough. Well, 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 Mr. Franklin Blake. You're looking fit, quite fit. Thank you, sir. You're looking well yourself. Let's see now. How many years has it been? Oh, five at least, sir. Five. My, 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 how time flies. Sir, sir, now, this matter of Colonel Herncastle's will. You're acquainted with your duties. 
And yes, sir, I've signed papers, and there's a birthday gift left to my cousin Rachel Brenda. I'm to take it to her. Very good. Now to work. The first clause provides for support and safekeeping for his animals, the cats and dogs and the horses he seems to prefer to human company. This paper covers that. You uh, sign here. All right, sir. Second clause directs his fortune to be used wholly for the establishment of a professorship of chemistry at Cameron University. Rumors were the colonel was addicted to opium. I suppose that explains the chemistry. Sign here. Yes, I've heard he took drugs. The third clause, you might as well read yourself. Read some uh, here. Right. Thirdly and lastly, I give and bequeath to my niece, Rachel Verinda, only child of my sister, Lady Julia Verinda, the yellow diamond belonging to me and known in the East as the Moonstone. Mr. Bra, a diamond? Hmm? Uh, oh, yes, there's a diamond, all right. Read on. Hmm. That said diamond should be given to my niece Rachel on her first birthday after my death, subject to the condition that her mother, Lady Verinda, be living at the time, and that my diamond be given into the hands of my niece by my nephew, Franklin Blake, in the presence of my sister, the said Julia Verinda. This I do in free forgiveness of my sister's conduct in closing her doors to me and publicly injuring my reputation as an officer and a gentleman during my lifetime. And the most generous forgiveness it turns out to be. The wicked colonel's diamond. You have it here? No, no, the bank. Been in the bank vault for years. At one time, the colonel hinted of a conspiracy against him, claimed the stone was some sort of sacred Indian jewel, part of a four-handed moon god, which to any serious person sounds like drug addiction. Is this moonstone really worth anything? We've had three appraisals. Of course, quite a stir of size and color. There's a flaw. But the least value put on the stone is 30,000 pounds. 30,000? What the old dog. There was also a paper instructing that if he died mysteriously, uh, which he did not, the jewel was to be sent secretly to a diamond cutter in Amsterdam and cut up into several smaller stones. That way he thought to destroy its identity. Strange. The colonel knew its worth. Why? Nothing strange, sir, when it comes to drugs. When will you be leaving for Yorkshire, Mr. Blake? And tomorrow afternoon. Lady Julia's invited me down to stay for two weeks before the birthday. You'll carry 30,000 pounds. Take care, my boy. I shall, Mr. Brown. You know, somehow I wish that I'd seen more of the count. Heavens, no, sir. God bless you so. But he was truly a wretched man. Goodbye, Mr. Blake. My regards to Lady Belinda, Miss Rachel. Bye, sir. Early the next morning, I went to the bank, presented my authorization, and was led to the strong room. I unlocked the family vault and saw a little wooden box. I slid open the cover and nestled in cotton with the stone. Even in that dim light, there streamed a burst like the harvest moon. It drew my eyes into a yellow deep as unfathomable as the heavens themselves. A strange, eerie feeling began to grip me almost hypnotic. I had to force myself to close the lid. I put the box carefully in an inside pocket, left the bank, and plunged into the street crowd, reaching the station just in time. Towards noon, I arrived at the quiet country town of Frisingal, feeling almost my natural self. For two weeks, the Moonstone was going to be my responsibility, and I prudently decided to place it in the local bank. I then hired a carriage and was driven out to the great Verinda house sitting high on the Yorkshire coast near the sea. The place had practically been a second home in my youth, and I felt a warm, comfortable sense of return. Franklin, sir. Won't you come in, please? My lady and Miss Rachel are out, sir. We weren't expecting you till this evening. I had a sudden change in plans. I hope it's no bother. Oh, no bother, sir. Only my father, he was so looking forward to meeting you at the station. Your father? Betridge, sir. The family steward. Oh, good old Betridge, of course. So you're his daughter. Well, you were just a bet. Where is he? 
down the beach walk, sir. The place they call Shivering Sand. He went to fetch one of the maids to lunch. That ugly place? I'll, I'll surprise him. Oh, Mr. Franklin, pardon, sir, but do you know any traveling jugglers? What? Indian jugglers, sir. They came to the house to show us their tricks. I overheard them talking about a gentleman from foreign parts coming here, and you're just back from the continent. His father drove them off because he thought they had snakes. No. No, I don't know any jugglers. Excuse me, sir. Father said it was silly. The beach walk led to one of the ugliest little bays on the Yorkshire coast. It was quicksand. At the turn of the tide, the whole face shivered and trembled in a most gruesome manner. Rounding the dunes, I saw two figures watching the tide. A woman and the plump, friendly form of old Betridge. Why do you visit this horrid place? I'm drawn to it, Mr. Betridge. Something draws me. Sam, the way it shivers. Betridge! What? Uh, who is it? Don't you recognize me? Why, Lord... This is Mr. Franklin. How are you, Betridge? Our fine boy, all grown to a man. Uh, Rosanna, this is our Mr. Franklin. Yes, I, I know Mr. Franklin. You know me? Yes, sir. From your pictures in the house. Excuse me. Please excuse me. Well, that's an odd girl. Uh, Rosanna's our newest maid, sir. She's a bit strange. Mark it down to that. I must say you're looking the pink, sir. Thank you. Tell me something, Betridge. Anything, sir. What? About the Indian jugglers who were here. I met your daughter. Edgar, if Penelope's bothered you, sir, I'll... No, no, not at all. Just tell me, what did they do? Nothing, sir. You know how women are. She was down by our front trees and heard some of their rigmarole. Asking a boy they had about a gentleman from foreign parts and did he have it about him. That's all, sir. I see. Something wrong, sir? No. No, not really, I'm sure. Come along. Perhaps it was silly. A conjure trick. But I felt rather clever for having put the diamond back in a bank. Still, it had to be coincidence, and reaching the house, I resolved to keep my imaginings to myself. Lady Julia and Rachel weren't expected home till sundown, so I went to my room to unpack. I lay down on the bed to rest, and I must have dozed off. But when I opened my eyes, it was dark. Who's there? Oh, it's me, sir. Rosanna. Oh, what are you doing? Just coming to wake you, sir. It's near dinner. Good Lord, I haven't even unpacked. Oh, I did it while you slept, sir. It's the dinner bell. Blast. I haven't got time to change. How do I look? Oh, ever so elegant, Mr. Franklin. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you. Yes, Lady Julia. Franklin, dear boy, so good to have you back. Oh, it's good to be back, Lady Julia. You look exactly the same. Oh, you're kind, Franklin. But you, I don't think I'd have recognized you. I would. I would have recognized you, Cousin Franklin. Rachel, dear. This is Rachel. This is Rachel. The little girl whose hair you so delighted in pulling and put fogs down her back. And got kicked in the shins for it. <laughs> I can't believe it. That you did those things? Why, Cousin Franklin. Well, no, I, well, I mean you... Well, you're beautiful. Really, sir? Thank you, sir. And you've grown handsome. Now we're even. Rachel? Now come to dinner, you two. Franklin, you must tell us all about the continent. And there it began. Rachel was undoubtedly the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. I couldn't take my eyes off her. In the days that followed, I found myself trying to spend every waking moment with her. Recalling our days as children. Walking, riding. <laughs> I even thought of bird watching. By the second week, I was very deeply in love. Franklin! Where are you? In here, my sitting room. Well, what on earth is... I'm painting. This door needed doing, so I'm doing it. I know, but cupids and birds... There. All done. Now, now don't smudge it. It's wet. 
This one's supposed to be you. What do you think? Well, it's not quite my nose. But, uh, who's this fancy one here? Oh, that's Godfrey Abelwhite. Cousin Godfrey, don't you remember him? Mm, dashing Godfrey. Oh, yes. The ladies' man. Works with women's committees or something, doesn't he? He'll be here for the party tonight. All the Abelwhites. Party? Franklin, today's my birthday. Oh, good Lord, Rachel. Stupid. I... Happy birthday. Thank you, sir. I'm dying to know what it is. What? Well, the black sheep colonel's gift. Mother said it wouldn't be anything nice. Well, you did bring it. Well, yes, yes. Rachel, what time is it? Almost four. I've got to do something. There's just time. Not having mind for anything but Rachel, I'd even forgotten the day. I rode full speed to Frinzingall, took the diamond from the bank and returned all dust and lather. I bathed, hopped into my party clothes and made it downstairs just as the first guests arrived. The Abelwhites, Mr. and Mrs., twin daughters, and ladies' committee man Godfrey. Cousin Franklin, lovely to see you. Oh, pardon me, cousin, there's Rachel. Lovely to see you. He went to Rachel and very neatly monopolized her attentions. The rest of the guests arrived and then, thank heaven, it was time to open the presents. From the late Colonel Herncastle. A box. No, Rachel, not that first. Oh, don't be silly, Mother. It won't bite. Oh. Oh, my, look. Just look. Exquisite. It's simply exquisite. Mother, look at it. No. Put it down, Rachel. It means no good. I looked at Lady Julia. Her eyes set in an ash-white face were riveted on the diamond. She quickly recovered her composure, but underneath I saw the same uneasiness I too had felt when I first saw the Moonstone. Then I knew why the Colonel's gesture of forgiveness had left the diamond to Rachel. She was fascinated, but Lady Julia was repelled. She could have thrown it as far as she could. Oh, look, everyone. Out on the terrace. The whole party turned. Standing on the terrace were two Indian jugglers and a boy. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Peter Lawford in Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, who is this Johnny Plug check, anyway? Well, you might call him the motorist's conscience, Hap. He's here to remind us to beat winter by having the oil and grease changed, putting in antifreeze... And the most important thing to do is check those spark plugs, too. You sure should. The spark plugs are the heart of a car's ignition system. When they're right, your chances of starting every time are better than ever. So have your spark plugs checked. If replacements are needed, your Autolite spark plug dealer will recommend Autolite spark plugs, like the Double Life Resistor spark plug that gives you smoother performance. And the Resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of Autolite spark plugs, ignition engineered for every use. So before winter hits hard... Check those important spark plugs. Don't delay. You should have done it yesterday. Yes, see your Autolite spark plug dealer, because from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Peter Lawford in Elliot Lewis's production of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. As if from nowhere, the Indians appeared on the terrace. The party streamed out to watch them. They were doing some ridiculously simple tricks and not doing them too well. Rachel was standing quite near them. I went to her quickly. Where on earth did they come from? Rachel, where's the diamond? Right here in my hand, see? Don't hold it up like that. 
Well, they've stopped. Is that all? All right, you fellows. Here's money. Now, now be off with you. Thank you, sir. Many thanks, sir. Well, really, there wasn't very much to it, was there? They picked up the money, not at all eagerly, and went off down the drive. There was only one thing to draw from it. What the colonel believed of the Moonstone was true. It was not forgiveness, but his vengeance. And I had been the instrument to put it in Rachel's hands. The dinner was quite gay, except for Lady Julia, who seemed very solemn, and myself. The talk turned around the diamond, Cousin Godfrey leading the abominable joke. <laughs> <laughs> After all, it's only carbon, you know. Just carbon. <laughs> uh, we should heat it over a fire, Miss Rachel. Expose it to a current of air and, uh, poof, no more anxiety about its safekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not funny, Mr. Blake? No, Dr. Candy, it didn't strike me. Uh, I suspect you haven't been sleeping well. Uh, you should let me give you a course in medicine. In my opinion, Dr. Candy, your course in medicine and groping in the dark are one and the same thing. Ah, but you're groping for sleep, sir. I could help. I've heard of the blind leading the blind, Doctor. Now I know what it means. <laughs> no, well, no, really, sir. Gentlemen, if I may ladies, say. please, shall we continue in the drawing room? Beverage, brandy and soda for the gentleman. <laughs> We adjourned to the first note of the seasonal rainstorm. I hoped to reach Rachel, but Cousin Godfrey made his move quicker and was already swarming over this charm. <laughs> he was staying the night, and since I felt a great urge to kick him, I prudently kept to myself. The approaching storm prodded the guests home early before the roads turned to mud. Dr. Candy was the last to leave. Well, storm's the least of my worries. A doctor's skin is waterproof, you know. <laughs> Well, good night, Mr. Blake. Good night, Doctor. Uh, if you're troubled sleeping tonight, uh, try a brandy and soda. Good night. Good, good night. night. Good night. Well, that's that. I think I'll bid you all good night myself. No, not yet, Rachel. Oh, no, not yet. Rachel, where are you going to keep the diamond? The cabinet in my sitting room. My dear, but it has no lock on it. <gasps> Mother, is this a hotel? We've no thieves. I want you to come to my room, Rachel, first thing in the morning. Yes, Mother. Good night, Godfrey. Good night, Cousin Rachel. See you early. Rachel, may I see you up? Please do, Franklin. What were you and Godfrey... Talking about? He proposed to me. Well, you're not going to... I love you, Rachel. A little more time, Franklin, please. The diamond, I've got to tell I'll you... I'll put it right in my cabinet. Good night. Yes, thank you, Betridge. There's a brandy and soda nightcap at your bedside, sir. Good night. Good night. Mr. Franklin, Mr. Franklin, wake up, sir. Please wake up. Mm. What? Betches, morning already? Yes, sir. Something terrible's happened, sir. Rachel. Uh, she's all right. The diamond, it's gone. Get my robe. Thanks. Come on. How did they break in, Betridge? Who, sir? Those blasted jugglers, of course. I've been all over the house, sir. It's still locked up tight. Don't worry, cousin, please. Rachel, Just be safe. Don't to talk. No, I don't want to talk. I won't. Lady Julia, how is Rachel? Is she... How else? She's upset, cousin. She won't Thoroughly. talk about it, Franklin, even to me. I'll go for the police. Betridge, saddle a horse. The fastest you've got. I dashed to my room, dressed quickly and got outside just as Betridge moved, arrived with a horse. I rode full gallop, furious with myself for not having spoken up about the engines. I was only thankful they hadn't touched Rachel. Reaching the police at Frinsingle, I rushed in and received the shock of my life.
Are those your jugglers, Mr. Blake? Sure. Yes. Yes, those are the ones, all right. Ah. There was a fuss at the tavern. The three of them, according to the record, have been here in jail since 11 last night. From what you tell me, this moonstone was still in the owner's possession at 11. These men couldn't have taken it. I saw the record with my own eyes. It was impossible. If not the Indians, who? Almost a year was to pass before the discovery of the truth. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Peter Lawford, in part one of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. In 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, boats, and industry. These products include bumpers, die castings, and batteries, such as the famous Autolite Stay Full, ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, both standard and resistor types, voltage regulators, wire and battery cable, Autolite bullseye sealed beam units, and Autolite original service parts for all Autolite electrical systems. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. So, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, the concluding portion of the first detective novel ever written, The Discovery of the Truth, Part Two of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. Our star, Mr. Peter Lawford. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone was adapted for Suspense by Richard Chandley. In tonight's story, Ellen Morgan was heard as Rachel. Featured in the cast were Betty Harford, William Johnstone, Ben Wright, Herb Butterfield, Pat Hitchcock, Norma Varden, Eric Snowden, Alistair Duncan, and Dick Beals. Peter Lawford will soon be seen co-starring in the Columbia picture, It Should Happen to You. And remember, next week, Mr. Peter Lawford in the concluding portion of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. You can buy Autolite standard or resistor type spark plugs, Autolite original service parts, and Autolite stay full batteries at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Peter Lawford in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents part two of the first detective novel ever written, a tale considered by many to be the greatest ever written. Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, our star, Mr. Peter Lawford. Hello, Mr. McSorley. Have you got your Thanksgiving bird yet? I got it all right, Harlow, but not for Thanksgiving. Uh, what do you mean? Well, I got the board for me wife because me car battery is a turkey. 
I forget to fill it with water, and it's cold as a cranberry bog in December. <laughs> well, you should have an Autolite Stay Full battery, Mr. McSorley. That's the famous battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Ah, yes, the battery with long and happy life. Right. Fiberglass retaining mats protect the power of every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give that Autolite Stay Full longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. So, friends, to quickly locate your Autolite battery dealer, whose service is all makes of batteries, just call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. I'll tell you the location of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents the concluding portion of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. Starring Mr. Peter Lawford, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Tell me, Mr. Blake, the diamond that belonged to your uncle? Yes, Sergeant Cuff. His will stated that I was to give it to his niece, Rachel, on her birthday. And you say this moonstone had a curse on it? It has been said, yes. Because it's believed he took it from an idol. An Indian moon god. And those Indian jugglers you saw at the jail, you believe they stole it? Yes. They were in the garden outside the house when the diamond was given to Rachel. But I've shown you our prison records, Mr. Blake. The Indians couldn't have stolen it. They were behind bars all last night. Who else was at the party? Let's see. Rachel, her mother, Lady Julia Verinda, our cousin, Godfrey Abelwhite, Dr. Candy, their family physician. And the servants, what of them? Betridge and a new housemaid. Her name, I believe, is Rosanna. All right, Mr. Blake, we'll look into it. Ah, there's the house. As soon as we entered the house, Sergeant Cuff went into Rachel's sitting room, hardly bothering with the cabinet from where the moonstone had been stolen. His eyes seemed to be much more taken with the door Rachel had painted and decorated with Cupid the afternoon of her birthday. Hmm. That's quite good work. There's a smudge on one of the uh, Cupids. Pity. Anyone know how it happened? Mr. Betteridge? Uh, one of the maid's petticoats with all the commotion this morning. Pity. Paint's dry now. Does anyone know which petticoat did it? I don't think any of them, Sergeant. That part of the door was the last to be painted. Couldn't have happened this morning. You're quite sure, Mr. Blake. I watched her finish it. About four yesterday afternoon. Oh, it would have dried in about ten hours. About two in the morning, then. You may have put something valuable in our hands, Mr. Blake. The smeared petticoat or whatever will bring us to the truth. You think it was worn by the thief? I think it was worn by someone. There's no evidence of thievery as yet, only that the diamond is missing. Mr. Betteridge, would you tell Lady Verinder I'd like ten minutes of her time, please? Preposterous, Sergeant. All my servants have been with me for years. If I allow you to search their clothes, it means I suspect them. They're as honest as you are. I'm sure they are, your ladyship. It's only a question of their help. The women especially. Now, if they knew I was going to inspect the wardrobes of everyone from your ladyship downwards... You're certain this is necessary? Before we can make another step. I've also asked Mr. Betteridge to get me the washing book to account for all the linen in case the article was sent to the washer and destroyed and to ask your daughter for her wardrobe keys. Where will you start? Oh, with Mr. Blake here, if he'll consent. Of course. Well, don't forget me, Sergeant. I'm in the next room. Then we'll do you next, Mr. Abelwhite. And when you finish, may I leave for London? Oh, it's a mere formality. You'll all be free to go. Uh, here's the wash book, Sergeant. Ah, thank you, Mr. Betty. And Miss Verinder's keys. Uh, my young lady refuses to have her wardrobe examined. Aha. Uh -huh. Betridge, was it explained to her? Uh, yes, sir. She started to cry and said, I won't because I won't. Well, you may return the wash book, Mr. Betteridge. Mr. Abelwhite, you may leave at any time. Thank you, Sergeant. That'll be all, Mr. Betteridge. Then you aren't going to search? All or none, sir. But why should Rachel... I don't understand. 
Uh, pardon my being personal, Mr. Blake. Uh, would it be wrong to say you're in love with Miss Verinder? No, it wouldn't be wrong. Love blinds to a great extent. Look here, are you implying that... Oh, just a moment. Out, out there in the hall. Uh, out there. Won't you come in? Rosanna. Well, excuse me. I, I was looking for Mr. Bettridge. I was told he was here. He just left, my girl. Oh, thank you. I... Excuse me. Rosanna. Rosanna Spearman. That's it. You know her? I've seen her once before, Mr. Blake, about five years ago. In prison. For theft. In prison? Well, there's the answer. Well, it's not the old answer, Mr. Blake. Will you promise to hold your temper? If I see sense in what you say. All right. Tell me, why does Miss Verinder refuse to cooperate to have her wardrobe examined? Because she... Because... Exactly. Because she knows more about the diamond than she's willing to tell. Couple that with Rosanna Spearman, who was a thief. She knows how to raise money and pledge a valuable without question. Now, that is preposterous. Why should Rachel need money? Well, for reasons she doesn't want to discuss. Something that would force her to go to great length. Scandal, if you'll pardon the word, sir. This is the detective mind, isn't it? Suppose Miss Verinder were to suddenly decide to leave this house, refuse point blank to help, as I think she will. I'm sorry, Sergeant. You don't know her. Ah, oh, it's a dirty little world, Mr. Blake. And I've had a deal of experience. I'll be the first to admit it if I'm wrong. But I don't think I am. The night came on and a heavy, muffled mood of suspicion settled over the house. Rachel stayed locked in her rooms and would speak to no one. The sergeant was wrong about her. He had to be. But I couldn't push the torture of his logic from my mind. I was afraid, deeply afraid of the coming day. The first news that terrible morning was that Rachel was going to leave the house. The colonel's vengeance was working in ways he never dreamed. Miss Verinder, I'd like to say once more that your leaving is a great obstacle to the recovery of your diamond. Now, knowing that, you still intend to leave? I do. Rachel, please, Rachel, you can't. I have nothing to say to you, Mr. Blake. Drive on. I stood there helplessly watching her go. There was nothing left but the truth of Sergeant Cuff's words. A scandal. Some terrible secret she dare not tell. I had to find out if I was going to help. Rosanna. If she had helped Rachel plot the theft, she would also know her secret. I went to the servants' hall only to find Betridge and Sergeant Cuff ahead of me. One of the gardeners said he saw her running toward the beach walk. Then there's a hiding place down there, if I'm not mistaken. Hiding place? It's almost all quicksand. The jewel had to be kept somewhere. Possibly the stained article of clothing, too. Miss Verinder's accomplice recovers the diamond to take to her later. Aye, we'd better hurry. Will you join me, Mr. Blake? We raced down the walk to the beach. Rosanna was nowhere in sight. Only her footprints. They led us finally to the very edge of the quicksand. Look as we might, there were no footprints returning. At almost the same moment, the terrible meaning dawned on us both. Did she know there was quicksand? Yes, Sergeant. She knew. First time I saw her was here. She walked into that muck. Deliberately. Oh, Rosanna wasn't the kind to scare, Mr. Blake. She must have had her own good reason. Back at the house, the news of Rosanna's death deepened the unhappy Paul. That afternoon, Sergeant Cuff was dismissed from any further investigation, and Lady Julia left for London to join Rachel. Later, I left the house myself, feeling terribly depressed and useless. I would have given my life to help Rachel, but there was no avenue left open. I took ship for the continent the next morning, hoping that time and distance would let me forget. Almost a year was to pass before I returned.
Autolite is bringing you Mr. Peter Lawford in Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Well, hello. Now I can eat turkey instead of crow on a Thursday. <laughs> got yourself an Autolite Stay Full battery, eh, Mr. McSorley? That I did, Harlow. Then you've got the battery that stays right on the case. Needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Why, that Autolite Stay Full just snaps my engine to life, Harlow. Yes, sir, Mr. Mack. A fast, dependable start every time and for a long time. Thanks to those fiberglass retaining mats. They surround every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give the Autolite Stay Full longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. So, friends, see your Autolite battery dealer for the best in battery service and the famous Autolite Stay Full, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. To quickly locate your nearest Autolite battery dealer, phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. That's right. Call me Western Union Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Peter Lawford in Elliot Lewis's production of the concluding act of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I returned to London in June 1849. I was informed of all that had happened in the year that I'd been away by the family lawyer, Mr. Bruff. Rachel's mother had died some months ago, and Rachel had been engaged to marry Godfrey Abelwhite. He broke off, of course, right after Lady Verinda died. Seems he was only interested in Rachel's money. Where is Rachel, Mr. Bruff? Here in London, living with the guardian appointed by her mother. Has she ever spoken of me? Not once, to my knowledge. As for the Moonstone, we've all respected her silence on that. Why does she resent me, Mr. Bruff? I think it was your attempt to help in an affair she once kept secret, whatever her reason. I just can't believe that Rachel stole her own diamond. I'm going to find out who did. I won't presume to stop you, but uh, how will you go about it? I'll start where it all took place. The house in Yorkshire. By the Lord, Harry, Mr. Franklin, it's good to see you. It hasn't been very happy here since you... I were... know, Betridge. That's why I'm back. The Moonstone, sir? Don't you think you should leave a sleeping dog lay, sir? Suppose you find Miss Rachel had... It won't make me stop loving her. That's all I wanted to know, sir. So I don't see how my helping you can be wrong. Do you remember that poor girl of ours, Rosanna Spearman? Of course. How could I forget? You left a coat here, sir, and I found a letter in one of the pockets addressed to you from Rosanna. Here it is. Sir, please follow the enclosed instructions... Do it when you are not observed. Go to the shivering sand at the turn of the tide. There's a rock ledge covered with seaweed. And attached to the rock is a chain which drops into the quicksand. Pull up the chain. There's the ugly place. Tide's almost out. Well, there's only one rock ledge. You go ahead, sir. Note said do it alone. That's her grave, too. I'd like to humor her. I went onto the rock ledge. The last surge of the sea fell away, and I walked out gingerly on the edge of the quicksand. Getting down on all fours, I fell under the glistening seaweed. After a moment, my hand touched the rusty links of a chain. It came up easily. Attached to the end was a rusted metal box. I forced it open. It was filled with a white cloth, on top of which was another letter bearing my name. I carried it all to the dry beach and unrolled the cloth. It was a nightshirt. 
On its sleeve was a smear of paint from Rachel's sitting room. And I recalled the words of Sergeant Cuff. Find the smeared article of clothing and you will know who took the diamond. I looked to see if it was marked with the owner's name. Finding the mark, I read Franklin Blake. My own name. I looked again. My own name. Plainly marked with my own name. The next thing I remember was being back in Bettridge's room with a drink of whiskey in my hand. One thing for sure, that nightgown's a liar, a pure liar. It's my nightgown, Bettridge. I couldn't have taken the diamond, but it's my nightgown. Then it's foul play. That's how I read it. What about Rosanna's letter, sir? Yes. Sir, I have a confession. A confession of my own misery in three words. I love you. Me? Well, what does she mean? That's what the servants believe, sir. They used to see her mooning at you, puttering around your room every chance she could. Yes, I remember. But it never entered my mind. What more does she say? I will be dead and gone when you read this letter. It is that which makes me bold. The morning the moonstone was stolen, I went to do my work in your room. Your nightgown lay across your bed, and I saw the stain of paint. I hate Miss Rachel because you love her. It was hard to believe you had stolen her diamond. I had once been a thief and been in prison for it. The nightgown is my only bond with you. I could have helped you. But I dared not speak outright, fearing your anger that I knew your secret. Miss Rachel has left. You will soon be leaving, too. I know there is no chance you're ever returning my love, but I will keep your secret. I go now to the shivering sands which have always drawn me. Remember me kindly, Rosanna Spearman. <laughs> I was at a complete loss. My search for the thief had led directly to myself. So now Rachel's attitude was no longer a mystery. She had left because she believed I had stolen the diamond. I went back to London and told Mr. Bruff everything. I suggest you do something for me, Mr. Blake. What's that, sir? I received a letter this morning from Dr. Candy. He was at the birthday party the night the diamond was stolen, if you remember. Driving home from the party that night, he nearly caught his death in the rain. He's been ill ever since. His letter suggests he has something of great importance to discuss with you. Will you please go see him? Very good of you to come out of your way to see me, Mr. Blake. Thank you, Doctor. You're looking well. I'd uh, like to apologize to you, Mr. Blake. Apologize, sir. Uh, the night of Miss Verinda's party, you and I sat next to each other. Uh, there was some joking about the diamond, do you recall? Well, not distinctly, no, sir. Just something unpleasant. Well, I, I told you I suspected you hadn't been sleeping well and to let me give you a course in medicine. I don't think I had been sleeping well. Uh, I decided to prove my medicine to you. Uh, if I could give you a good night's sleep without you knowing it... What? I was going to come back the next day and ask you how you slept. You would have said, fine, and without medicine. And I was going to say, ah, but you did have medicine, sir. Dr. Candy, did you give me something that night? It was a dose of laudanum, a part of the opium family in your nightcap. I hope you'll accept my apology, Mr. Blake. But if I took the diamond... What did I do with it? I feel I owe you all the help I can give. Uh, are you willing to try an experiment? I'd do anything, Doctor. There's a chance that under the right conditions, uh, taking a similar dose of laudanum, you might repeat exactly what you did the night of the birthday. You might very well have hidden the diamond somewhere in the house. Uh, with witnesses to watch, it uh, would prove your innocence. Yes, but it would have to be done at the Verinda house. Well, I'll write to Miss Rachel, uh, with your permission, telling her everything. I'm sure she wants your innocence proved as much as you yourself. 
It was a very nervous time for me, waiting for Rachel's answer. With great relief, her letter came saying she accepted Dr. Candy's explanation. The house was at our disposal, and she wished us all success for the experiment. I wrote Mr. Bruff, asking him to be one of the witnesses. Then Dr. Candy and I left for the Verinda house. Ready, Mr. Blake? Of course, Doctor. Get on with it. If you want my opinion, the whole thing is humbug. All right, Mr. Bruff, we have your opinion. <clears throat> Forty minims, laudanum, in weak brandy and soda. Hey, you're witnessing, Mr. Bruff? I'm witnessing. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, drink it, Mr. Blake. A waste of time. Now, Mr. Blake, you may retire to your bed. How long before this is supposed to work? Yeah, not before midnight. Mm. Look, mm. he's moving. <laughs> Moonstone. Indian devils. In the house. Kill Rachel. He's getting up. Huh? Huh? In that cabinet. No lock on it. He'll take it. He's going out of the room. Hey, take off your boots. Come on. Went right to the cabinet. Amazing. Yeah. There's a piece of crystal to simulate the diamond in the drawer. Ah, there. There, he's found it. Doesn't look like he knows what to do. He dropped it. Going over to that sofa. Uh, he couldn't have done that before. Uh, the sedative effect is coming on. Uh, he slumped on the couch. Uh, it's all over. Let him sleep there. When I awoke the next morning, they told me what I had done. I proved only that Dr. Candy's joke had caused, was caused by my unconscious behavior. But now, and what had happened afterwards was still a mystery. We had come to another blank wall. It was a month later. An item in the newspaper caught my eye. Some East Indian jugglers had been in a fight in a tavern in one of the lowest parts of London. One of them had been stabbed. The others had escaped. Almost at the same moment, I received an urgent message from Mr. Bruff to meet him at the Wheel of Fortune, the tavern mentioned in the news dispatch. Up these stairs, Mr. Blake, quickly. What is it, Mr. Bruff? In this room here. Good Lord. He's almost done for, poor beggar. <laughs> On the bed lay a man dressed in sailor clothes. On the floor next to him was a small wooden box, open and empty. The box that had held the moonstone. I looked down at the man's face. There was a brown mark beneath on the bedsheet. I saw that his dark skin was only stained. I looked hard. Beneath the stain and the heavy growth of beard was the face of Godfrey Abelwhite. Hello, cousin. Godfrey. Surprised, cousin. Godfrey, you took the diamond. Oh, good joke. I saw you come out of Rachel's sitting room. You dropped it. I, I picked it up. Simple. And you kept it? I like money. Better reason. Those Indians have been after me for a year. Thought I could fool them. Didn't, did I? Oh, Moonstone, fascinating jewel. Exquisite, almost worth your life. It 
was some months later that a small news item appeared on an inner page of the Times. It stated that the worshippers of an ancient four-handed moon god were rejoicing over the return of a fabulous yellow diamond to a recess in their idol's forehead. It was a small item. I doubt if many people read it. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Peter Lawford. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. In 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, boats, and industry. These products include dial indicating and recording thermometers, bumpers, die castings, and batteries such as the famous Autolite Stay Full, ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, both standard and resistor types, voltage regulators, wire and battery cable, Autolite bullseye seal beam units, and Autolite original service parts for all Autolite electrical systems. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. So, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, it will be our pleasure to present the first radio adaptation of one of the most amazing human documents ever written, the personal diary of Emily Woldridge called The Wreck of the Maid of Athens. Our star, the first lady of suspense, Miss Agnes Moorhead. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawick and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone was adapted for Suspense by Richard Chandley. Featured in tonight's cast were Betty Harford, Ellen Morgan, Norma Varden, William Johnstone, Ben Wright, Herb Butterfield, Eric Snowden, and Alistair Duncan. Peter Lawford will soon be seen co-starring in the Columbia picture It Should Happen to You. And remember, next week, Miss Agnes Moorhead in The Wreck of the Maid of Athens. You can buy Autolite Stay Full batteries, Autolite Original Service Parts, and Autolite Standard or Resistor Spark Plugs at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network.